it's really funny that they would have a perfect illustration of a sun rising and setting on a flat earth due to perspective. This is the point where the moon went directly over the zenith in the sky. And we're going to be able to tell that with this azimuthal grid here. And as the, here comes the moon across here. And I'm going to stop it right in the middle. Um, right on the dot. And uh, you're going to see that uh, it, <laughs> what, what that is, folks, that is 90 degrees directly directly above you right there 90 degrees uh, we'll need another point and i've got that preset as well that this point's going to be called uh schmidt island you scroll down and there's the moon but it's not directly overhead is it no it's directly at 10 degrees off the horizon and you can see uh, the line the line right here going um up to the moon the, for off the azimuthal grid. If you can imagine, that's the viewpoint of the fella that's laying on his back in the middle of the Indian Ocean. <laughs> He's looking straight up, and this line right here is the line that he is, it, that's his line of sight. And from way up here at Schmidt Island, uh, our line of sight is obviously not directly ab above us like it is for him, but it's to the side. now. Starting with Eratosthenes and including Robotham, all this triangulation was done in complete um, uh, ignorance, for lack of a better word, of the atmosphere or the atmos plane and how that affects light waves incoming from the celestial areas. And we know pretty, pretty damn well, 100%, that refraction is causing um, not just perspective, uh, is causing the sun and moon and stars to rise and set. And so just now, as of 2017, are people starting to model these things and, and take these triangulations and factor in the uh, atmosphere, which does behave as a subjective convex lens. And um, at this point in the game, we just don't know what the sun and moon are. We don't know how distant they are. We can make assumptions and we can draw assumptions based on triangulation. And that's great. You know, we've had these values since the late 1800s or the mid 1800s when Parallax did them. Um, but when, you know, they're totally failing to factor in the, I believe one of the biggest variables, which is that of the atmosphere. Um, right. that and using parallax to find out how far something is, is nothing more than trigonometry. So we're going to use trigonometry. Uh, I've got a formula set up for that right here. I'm just going to punch in the numbers and it's going to give us the information. Um, so basically between two points, 
and up to the moon we're going to measure how far the moon is and finally we now have everything we need for our equation to solve for x so x will represent the distance from the moon to my location in florida so we simply plug in the values where they belong crunch them out and what do you fucking know we found that the moon is 224,000 573.102 miles from my front door. Okay, so it's 224,573 2, miles. Okay, so let's see what we get. Uh, let's plug in 89.4 because we had to account for Earth's curvature and forgot that I... There we go. Um, so we have to count for Earth's curvature, which gives us a parallax of 0.6, which makes this 224,573.1. Is that right? 224,573? 224,573.1. Okay, so this formula works. But what if the Earth is flat and we put in 55.4? For this degree, we go back to her original degree that she had. Oh, wait a second. Now the moon is 3,409.143 miles away. Hmm. So let me just ask you a question Does the moon look like it is 3,409 miles away? Or do you think it looks like it's 224 and a half thousand miles away? Use your own observation. Let's see what the ending is here. The conclusion is that your assertion that the moon is only 3,000 miles away is horseshit. So, Duran is. So, I've got to ask you based on the formula, is it 3,000 miles away or is it 220 whatever thousand miles away? Because he seems to think that he's absolutely correct, but I've just proven that, well, if the Earth is flat, it, it says that it is 3,000 miles away, and he's wrong. So, you've just got to make the decision. Formulas will tell a different story depending on what the reality is, depending on what the reality is, depending on what the reality is. And as I love to point out and have pointed out many times, I will never get over the idea that the, the coincidence of... The fact that if you look at the moon and when TJ did his triangulation, he came out, uh, he and Red, right, came out with a distance to the moon of 3,409 miles, which is really close to my 3,415.9 miles. But here's the cool thing about the numbers in this. And I, I have to bring this up because I just think it's so amazing. But 3415.9, okay, I don't need to tell you how close that is to pi, uh, just as far as the numbers go. Pi being 3314159. Get rid of the one, you've got 3415.9. Point nine, that 3415.9 miles up translates to precisely 1803600 feet. If that is just too bizarre, and if that isn't bizarre enough, when you plug in that 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 1803600 feet to a distance to the horizon calculator, you get a distance to the horizon of 6225.0 miles, which is precisely one quarter the circumference of the Earth. And if you were to project a light up that high in two directions, you would have a light that covers precisely half the circumference of the Earth. Now, yeah. that is just too weird, people. Um, and, and this whole mathematical construct works out in really weird ways. And if you think that isn't weird enough, you would go ahead and start plotting out the orbits of the planets around the, the sun or the earth, even in the heliocentric model. And what you come up with is an absolutely mathematically perfect, beautiful spirograph design, right? <laughs> what is up with that in a Big Bang universe where it's all chaos? Where, where is the symmetry coming from? <laughs> well, it's coming from the math, and it's also 
coming from the fact that this is a created construct, guys. Of course there is logic and reason and divine numbers involved because it is not a, a cosmic accident. There is order to this chaos. And whether you and want you to admit that or not, it's the way it is. So what I want to do then is let's just take this a step further and let's keep it in the realm of observation. All right. And let's just say Red's rhetoric was right. Okay. And there is this uh, 0.6 degree of parallax um, on the earth. And let's take, and since we have the sun and the moon in the sky, and they are both, of course, the same apparent size, we can do that very, very same trigonometry on the sun. Absolutely we can. And if we were to do that, what do you suppose is going to happen if we uh, did that trigonometry on the sun between uh, California and Florida? Well, I can tell you what it's going to come out to be. It's going to come out using red zone formula and observation, um, measuring angles to the sun. It's going to come back showing that the sun is also 224,000 miles up. Whoops. Yes. That's a problem. Yes. <laughs> That so, is that. That's th what you just said. Is something that can be taken to any mathematician, and and just put to them. Say, look, this is the situation. This is the basis for why you think you're on a globe, and uh, you can't have ninety three million miles and two hundred thirty four thousand, hundred thousand. You know, you can't. And well, like you just said, the equation that says one distance for one thing is the same equation for the distance for the other thing. You know, and it's the same uh, degrees arc anyway. Yep. So it is definitely, yeah, both same distance. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so that's, you know, and, and that, of course, is using their own formulas, their own observation, their own trigonometry. And, of course, if we modify it um, and take that parallax value out and make the Earth flat again, what do we get? Well, we're going to get the sun also is at 3,400 miles, which is exactly what the flat earthers have been saying. The reason that I think that that 3,400 miles is probably a pretty good figure, and like I said, I've stated this a million times, is because it, it, it pans out when you are doing a distance to the horizon uh, and you get that 6225 in each direction. Okay, so what we've got here is Tycho's crater on the moon. Okay, and then we have the diameter from approximately here all the way to there. I don't know if you can see my cursor. So straight there across diameter from there to there. And then we have the circumference right the way right around. Okay, so what we're going to do is going to overlay that one on top of Google Earth. That's all built on the math, science is math. Okay, so we go from there. And then we'll bump up Google Earth. And there it is, Google Earth. What we're going to do is we're going to put on In fact, what we'll do is just turn that around a bit. Um, So we're going to put on where we're going to place this image and that image there is an 86 kilometer diameter so we can see that the diameter of Tycho's crater is 86 kilometers okay 86 kilometers um, I need to do a bit of math because I'm not very bright when it comes to math um, that's probably why I'm intelligent, because I'm not educated. Okay, so we've got the diameter there of 86 kilometers, which will give us a circumference of 270 kilometers. Okay, I think that's right. Right, so, so what I've done is I've done a circle. I'll just go to um, measurements there. You can see that the measurements for this uh, circle that I've done this path 
is 270 kilometers. Okay, so there's your 270 kilometers circumference. And then if we add on an, uh, the Tyco image, which is that, and you would say that's kind of in the right place. Would you agree with that? Okay, give or take 10, 20 miles. Um, right, so we can see down here at the bottom, the IL um, elevation, about 200, well, 75 miles, 47 miles. That's the uh, I, the I elevation. You, it's down here, I don't know if you can see that bottom right hand corner so if we come back up okay that's um, and then we're 111 miles high okay that's what we observe in the sky we can see Tycho's crater you know you can zoom straight into it and see it very clearly okay so if we come back and we'll say about 500 about well, it's 551 miles high okay now remember the moon is over 200 and I think it's 238,000 miles. We'll check that in a second. Um, so that's 551 miles high. Let's take it back to a thousand miles high. So we're 1133 miles high. Okay, I'm going to turn off the red ring because that, yeah, you can see that it just kind of gets in the way. So we'll turn off the red ring, but you can still see Tycho's crater. Okay, and we're, we're, we're only 1,000. Now we've got 237,000 miles to go. You can see where I'm going with this. So let's take it, take it all the way back to, wow, let's, let, let's, should we go 10,000? Or oh, there's 11,000. 11,000 miles high, and we can just see Tycho's Crater. That's not kind of what we observe, is it? I mean, we kind of observe Tycho's Crater to be quite big. Okay, this is what we observe. Now, and this is what we get. And this is what we observe. And this is what we get. You see the problem? Okay, well that's only 11,000 miles high. Let's go back a bit more. Not sure how far more we can go back. Oh, well, there you go. And um, just straighten up a little bit. But England and it was Devon that it was over, Devon and Somerset. So we're 30, as high as we can possibly go, 37, oops, 37,363 miles high. Can you see Tycho's crater? I've still got another 200,000 miles to go. Can you see what the problem is? As I say, science and math and the pseudoscience nonsense, we've been told lies. I've got 200,000 miles to go. Can you see where the problem's gonna lie if I come back even more? Okay, this is based on Google Earth. And maybe Google aren't that bright. Maybe they've made massive mistakes. But 200,000 miles worth of a mistake? I think not. I think what you're being told is lies. So if I zoom back in, you can see, you can just about see a dot of where it is. that eh? Tycho's crater yeah we're being told lies that's all I have to say on that
that's why I want to hear from, you know, the listeners, uh, especially the ballers, because I want to hear a valid reason why this experiment that we're watching right here, and it's on our channel, anybody can go and look at it and read the comments. It's called the 7.5 mile flat earth laser test on a frozen lake. It was obviously very cold, likely below zero. And like I said, the things you have to consider here is that density altitude was likely identical on each side of the lake. The fact that it was below freezing tells you that the moisture uh, component has been frozen out of the air, crystallized and dropped to the ground, point blank. Um, and the fact that he was able to track with that laser beam all the way across the lake, all eight miles or seven and a half miles across the lake, tells you that, you know, refraction must be absolutely miracle working, you know, for it to be able to do that, except the fact that refraction couldn't be happening because you have identical density altitude on each side of the lake. It's kind of like if you shine a light through a glass of water, if you go on one side, um, and the water is essentially the same temperature, it's going to go straight across. Whereas if you start the light from above it, right, then it's going to hit that denser water and it's going to refract and kick it off to the side. Well, I'm saying that that condition simply would not exist uh, over a lake that's frozen, you know, in the middle of the night. Not going to happen. 302 pixels to 290. And then, of course, there's this video right here, which apparently was shot in the desert uh, where there's going to be a lot less moisture and so whenever there's less moisture you're going to obviously have less refraction and magnification you don't get to pick the anomalies that seem to agree with your views and ignore the common observations that don't and still call yourself an honest investigator that is intellectually dishonest so thinking about all this and thinking about what I had just shown you regarding atmospheric lensing, magnification, refraction, all that with regard to cities and uh, objects at a distance on the land, I got to thinking, well, I wonder how this would work with the sun and moon. So this is what I came up with. I've got my magnifying sheet frame and I created a, a little stand uh, to paste the sun on it and keep it the same height over the flat surface of a table. So the sun is always going to be parallel with the surface. And uh, check this out. All right. Here's the first test of a sun moving over a flat surface. And with no atmospheric magnification, it does what we might expect it would. It gets smaller as it goes away from us. All right. Now let's see what happens when we add in our atmospheric magnification. Again, water and refraction. Water causes magnification and refraction, right? So let's bring the sun back. Oh, check this out. Refraction bends the light downward. <laughs> it made the sun set on a parallel surface. As it was moving parallel, the same height, the whole way over a flat surface, the refraction caused the sun to set. Not only that, well, let's uh, bring in the beginning of that little test, and we see that it maintained pretty much the same size, too. Uh, pretty close. Uh, and, of course, that's because as it's moving away, the magnification is, is still uh, taking place. And so even though the sun's further away than it was in the beginning of the test, uh, the magnification basically preserved the same size and the refraction made it set. Of course, again, depending on how much moisture is in the air, we could see that the sun doesn't appear to change in size at all as it goes down. We could see sometimes perhaps that it looks like it's getting bigger when it goes down. You ever see like a really big sunset or moon rise, moon set, you know, where one of them looks really large on the horizon? Well, that could be because there's lots of moisture in the air. Uh, causing that effect or when there's less moisture in the air obviously you won't have as much magnification taking place and so it looks smaller as it goes away so it's all relative to the amount of moisture that's in the air now I'm just gonna put forward a crazy idea for you to think about and that is <laughs> if Rob Skiba could figure this out I'm just I'm I'm just gonna go out on a limb here. I think it 
it's quite possible that the creator of the cosmos could have figured out the same thing and engineered our beautiful sunsets. See how the clouds uh, anchor down to the horizon. Let me shut it there. That's exactly how the sun would do on flat Earth. Okay, back to the Copernican principle, and this is what they tell us: the sun is 93 million miles away. Now I'm going to show you evidence through sunsets that shows the sun light following the sun over the horizon and it shrinks as it goes over. Now there's no way it would do that if the sun is 93 million miles away. Okay, first I'm going to show you some footage from the ISS. Okay, now watch this animation. Watch this sunset. Now this is exactly, if they came to me and said do an animation, this is how I would do it if the sun were 93 million miles away. Just like that, have the whole horizon fade evenly. But that's not what we see. Okay, wow, look at that. Look how the light lifts off the ground like a big wedge or like lifting up a sheet of paper. That's incredible footage. Okay, here's a little uh, illustrator or a little cartoon from a website called timeanddate.com. It's really funny that they would have a perfect illustration of a sun rising and setting on a flat earth due to perspective. Okay, these next three slides, uh, the sun is almost set already behind the horizon, but watch as the sunlight shrinks and follows the sun. It's definitely a locally illuminating sun, not far away, not very big, and definitely not 93 million miles away. Okay, remember this video from the beginning of the video? I showed you this one and how it's circling over the earth and watch it sweep to the right like a bowler bowling it in there for a strike. Okay, now I want you to pay attention to the way the light follows the sun. The sunlight's going to shrink, right, as it follows the, 
the locally illuminating sun. Now watch this. See it shrinking, following the sun? You do not get that if the sun is 93 million miles away. The entire horizon should fade evenly, just like this supposed shot taken from space of the Earth. You can clearly see the way they depict it. They depict the demarcation between day and night, or light and dark, as a long straight line. And you can see the long straight line moving as one solid piece. That means that the sunset should all fade, the entire horizon should fade evenly. But that's not what we observe, as we will see and as we've seen in the footage so far. The sunlight shrinks and follows the sun over the horizon. So these time-lapse sunsets are definitely the nail in the coffin for heliocentrism. But this particular one here, shot from above the clouds from this observatory, is the final nail in the coffin. Look at how the sun just shrinks and the light shrinks to nothing. That cannot happen, as I showed you in the, uh, when the sun illuminates the entire Earth, which it does from 93 million miles away, it has to. Uh, you don't get this isolated uh, look at the sunlight trailing the sun. That's only possible with a small sun, close, not very high, illuminating locally. I mean, if this isn't proof to you, then you gotta take the blinders off. Uh, especially the ballers, because I want to hear a valid reason